Cities After is a bi-monthly podcast about the future of cities. Grounded in our daily urban struggles, it is part dystopian and part utopian. My intention is to entice your civic imagination into action, because we know that a more just and sustainable urban future is possible. This is Miguel Robles Duran, and I dare you to imagine our cities after. COVID, COVID. global warming. Global warming. Gentrification, Exploitation. homelessness, Neophagy. racism, colonialism, patriarchy, hunger, police brutality, private profit, capitalism, capitalism, capitalism. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. In this podcast, I am very excited to be joined by Andrew Ross, a highly influential social activist and professor of social and cultural analysis at New York University. Andrew is the author or editor of 25 books and over 250 articles on a wide variety of topics, including labor and work, urbanism, politics, technology, environmental justice, alternative economics, and so on. He often contributes to The Guardian, The New York Times, The Nation, Art Forum, Jacobin, London Review of Books, and Al Jazeera. Professor Ross is politically active in many social movement fields. He is the co-founder of several groups, including Gold Labor Artists Coalition, Global Ultra Luxury Faction, the Coalition for Fair Labor, Occupy Student Debt Campaign, Strike Debt, The Debt Collective, and Decolonize This Place. His books include Stone Man, The Palestinians Who Built Israel, which was a winner of the Palestinian Book Award, Creditocracy and the Case for Debt Refusal, and Bird on Fire, Lessons from the World's Least Sustainable City. In this podcast, we will talk about his most recent book, Sunbelt Blues, The Failure of American Housing, which I highly recommend. This book makes a direct connection with the previous podcast by building on the history of suburbanization in the United States and how the entertainment fantasy industry helped shape the utopian ways in which American suburbia is perceived around the world. This podcast will take us to Central Florida, home of Walt Disney's dreams for building perfect cities. Hello, Andrew. Welcome to the podcast. It's really wonderful to have you. And I feel very excited to talk about your most recent book, uh, in which you talk about uh, housing crisis uh, from the current housing crisis from the uh, perspective of Florida and specific research that you did on Central Florida and one of the things after reading your book that came to me um, as like a highlight uh, of course is that the way you talk about Disney right um, uh, most Americans understand Disney as a company that uh, produces a lot of media content produces movies cartoons um, uh, they see it as, a, as an overarching mostly media company uh, obviously you have the theme parks which as you say in your book they have become so influential in the American culture that it's almost like a rite of passage right from generation to generation where families invest a lot of money um, in bringing their kids to that but very few people have uh, an understanding of Disney as a pioneer in real estate development uh, uh, or one of the big pioneers of real estate development. Um, in uh, part of your book, in, in a chapter when you talk specifically about Disney, you um, say the following. It says, like, the Disney World Enterprise, originally codenamed the Florida Project, has been the most successful capitalist land development in modern history. Right? Um, you mentioned here that in 2019, Disney theme parks and resorts generated more revenue, that's $26.23 billion, um, than its media networks, which are $24.83 billion, and more than twice as much as their studio entertainment division. Right? And so here we're talking about um, another kind of material impact, which is the built environment. I mean, not only this, the psychological impact that all their media apparatus has brought into the country, but um, a very steady and, and, and huge uh, real estate apparatus. I was wondering if uh, just to start, you can tell us a little bit more about your more outstanding findings, you know, as you were doing this research in relationship to Disney, uh, perhaps from a historical view, but also in a contemporary form. Yeah, um, I mean, the, that quote that you read about land, as a land development venture 
Disney World itself has has just been spinning endless profits, and I, I can't think of any other. I can't think of an equivalent that that is anywhere near as profitable. Um, and and as you said, I think there are the because of Walt Disney's own fascination with small town America, and that's the sort of core of a lot of the, the actual Disneyland and Disney World built environment, it did have a lot of influence on, um, on the revival of uh, Main, Street, Main Street America, and uh, in particular, the influence on new urbanism, which in the 1990s, with the development of Celebration in particular, which was my point of entry, um, you can see these two things sort of fusing together. And it made a lot of sense in, in many ways for, for Disney to develop that portion of land that they had in Central Florida uh, in the form of a new urbanist. You know. Can you uh, briefly explain for our audience uh, how would you define this? What is this new urbanism and uh, how does it come by? I mean, into sort of American culture, especially in planning culture. Well, in Florida, and Florida was the epicenter of new urbanism because <coughs> um, Duane uh, Platter Zyberg, the firm, yes. was most active there and, uh, and produced a lot of their, you know, prototype models there. Um, it's, uh, in terms of celebration itself, which is a very good example, it, it's not, there's, no, there's no single blueprint for new urbanism, but celebration you know, ticked off a lot of the boxes. So compact, relatively dense, interconnected uh, street grid pattern, pedestrian friendly, um, neo-traditional housing styles that uh, of which there's a, va a great variety yeah, within the town. A lot of popular architects, uh, especially from the postmodern times, you know, were built well designing for them too. No, they, yes, they were. That was Michael Eisner had his stable of postmodern architects who who he asked to are commissioned to do signature buildings and celebration, um, and that added to the <coughs> the attraction. Um, and Celebration sort of became a celebrity town in a way, initially. And uh, I'd gone there in the late 1990s to write uh, a book about the, the experiences of the residents themselves. Mm -hmm. Not so much the built environment, but the experience of the residents. And, um, and that book was the Celebration Chronicles. Um, and I promised my uh, neighbors at the time that I would return after 20 years. Um, and you did. <laughs> to check in, <laughs> because all, all new towns need some time to mature before they can be judged. If judgment is your, yes. is your goal, not particularly my goal. But So I, I did more out of a sense of uh, diligence, uh, go back there, start going back there and interviewing people 20 years later and very quickly fell down the hole, the rabbit hole of small town politics. Yeah which in celebration is a very, very deep hole <laughs> and no one's quite sure who the white rabbit is. And, uh, and I had no particular interest in, in, in writing about it. I really was just checking in. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing led to another and it turned into this book. Like a lot of my books are accidental books or let, let's just say they're not intentional. They develop organically. Um, and so, in the course of the interviews, I realized that the big story in town <coughs> had to do with uh, the actual town center, yes. which had been sold by the Disney company to uh, a Wall Street private equity firm. Which is crazy, because you're talking about the whole downtown, right, as, a, as, a, as, a, as one asset, no? There's not plots of land or anything, it is the whole downtown sold to one company. Yeah. It's, crazy. It, it's a difficult thing to wrap your head around, yeah. but on the commercial real estate market in America, it's yeah. it's not uh, it's not unusual for for a property that but large. Do you think that the 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 policy? I mean, a lot of people don't don't know that. Um, you mentioned this in your book uh, quite well that uh, Disney, from the very get go, when it started getting into development uh, in Florida, they got special exemption status where they were about uh, allowed to 
craft their own code, craft their own sort of normatives and so for forth Disney right? for Disney World. Yeah. Um, do you think any of these sort of like autonomous uh, uh, sort of principles had to do with the planning uh, of, of celebration to allow this or was it something that just generally happened? No, celebration was, uh, uh, because celebration was de-annexed from the Disneyland empire, it was part of Osceola County, um, the, the planners had to deal with the county. And uh, so it was a very complicated set of negotiations over the actual blueprint and the, um, uh, the, the, the regional impact, the design of regional impact. Unlike in Disney World, which is very much an autonomous, yes. sometimes referred to as Florida's 69th county. Um, so it, it was in the open, it was in the public, and all the documentation is lodged in the planning office, which you can, you know, you can request and consult. So it was a different kettle of fish from, from Disney World itself. That said, the company is very powerful in central Florida and has a considerable degree of influence, so it tends to get what it wants and that also played a role in the development of celebration. Um, the, plan, uh, the plan was always to sell off uh, you know, portions of the land there, which the company's been doing over the last uh, 25 years or so. There's still a few portions left. But, and unusually, uh, the company will reserve a veto right Usually developers, when they're done, when they've sold off everything, they just, that's the yeah, last they you see Yeah, they give it away, yeah, yeah. With Disney, typically, they, uh, they reserve the veto right over uh, certain developments in town. So they'll always have a stake in celebration, even though they've, they've sold everything off. But at this point in time, um, they're so quite active governmentally. Um, a lot of people are of, you know, a lot of people believe that Disney just is, withdrawn from celebration and sold off everything is not actually true. So the fact that they sold off the town center, however, came as a surprise to people because the firm in question uh, had very little prior experience of managing complex downtown. communities yeah. like this and had only been in existence for a couple of years. So it was a very murky mm -hmm. uh, deal. Mm -hmm. And um, it being a private equity firm, uh, they did what private equity has done in countless communities across America. I mean, they basically uh, squeezed the property dry. Yes, um, extract as much Leveraging as the assets, draining off equity by refinancing, uh, jacking up the rents, and yes. doing a, a terrible job of maintenance. Yes. Um, so. That's a story that's familiar and to And how, how, how do you see, um, sort of, it, it, one of the things that you do in the book is that you contrast a lot uh, celebration as being perhaps one of the steady communities. I mean, despite all of these sort of a downtown scandal, obviously with a, a much higher income uh, mm -hmm. level than the majority of the population in, in Central Florida. Um, and, and, and you put a, also a, a big emphasis on mentioning the, the other side of like Disney development, which is not precisely Disney, but it's basically the byproduct of the low income sort of uh, neighborhoods and, and things that are around it. Um, in, in that way, that contrast um, together with different financial crises and so on has rendered a very different kind of Florida in, in, in today's times, right? I mean, Central Florida. How do you read the contrast now, 2021, pandemic, because your book discusses pandemic uh, consequences on this, um, the selling of the downtown part of a, of a celebration, uh, plus the many encampments and the many things that have going on in terms of homelessness and poor communities, low income populations and so on. How do you see that contrast? What is mm -hmm. that contrast? Mm -hmm. Well, it, that's really the heart of the book in a way. Um, because the other, the other story that I found in Celebration, <clears throat> other than the town center, which I, I tell that story because a lot of the residents downtown fought back, unusually, um, the, the condo association, and they fought a very long and bitter legal battle in the courts with the private equity firm. So I tell that story. Then the other story um, I came across, which led me out of town, 
was the fact that uh, Celebration High School at the time was enrolling the largest number of homeless students of any school in Florida, which for an affluent town is, was a bit of a surprise. Yes, yes. Of course, the catchment area for the school extends outside of the town. And so I discovered when I followed the students outside the town, many of them were living with their families in dilapidated budget motels on, on the strip, the commercial strip that is the main drag of Osceola County. And so that's what took me out of town and into this other environment, um, which, is, which is much more symptomatic of the housing crisis across America in a way. I mean, celebration's a part of it, but celebration nights are relatively well healed. Yeah, that's, that's what I found so, I guess, so uh, impactful about the book that, I mean, you, you can read it through the eyes of Central Florida, but in a way, it's a, it's a small piece of a, a much larger issue. I mean, it's a very representative of a lot of things that are happening around. I mean, right now that you're referring about the amount of kids um, uh, and the, 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 sc the school situation in terms of the address they do, and there's a part in your book when you say that uh, that most HUDs, uh, the Housing and Urban Development of uh, the United States, uh, the counting of, of homeless population is is uh, it does not take into account uh, people that pay uh, hotels, right? No. Uh, that live in hotels uh, simply because they discuss that you're able to pay it and therefore you're not homeless and so on. But you argue here that the best way to uh, understand the the homeless situation, homelessness situation in the United States is to looking at uh, school data, right? And there's like a striking data here that you put is like federal data shows that during 2017 and 2018 school year, more than one and a half million kids in public schools experience homelessness. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be a suggestion also in here that we're not looking or that we don't have yet the metrics to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. Right. And in your book, you uh, look at motels as one of the sort of spaces of the housing crisis. You also look at tents, tent cities, you know, uh, and you look at um, kind of like rural or in the in the jungle kind of uh, settlements. Right. Mm -hmm. um, a, a different kinds of settlements. How do you measure this? I mean, are you able to let us know how? How many are they? What is the percentage of people living in this situation in Central Florida? How do we do it to understand the scope of the crisis? Well, it's a good question. Um, I think in some ways that the, 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 the quantitative challenge of um, just you know estimating the number of homeless in America, there's, there, there's an overemphasis on, on the difficulty or the challenge of doing that in a way. I understand why, why there's so much uh, uh, attention to it, because it has to do with federal appropriations and how much money gets you know, allocated to jurisdictions. Um, so it, it, the federal data matters, but everyone who is in the homeless service sector um, will, will tell you that uh, that the, the undercounts are for, you know, chronic, that the, the actual numbers are far below the reality. And uh, you mentioned the motels. There are, um, there are millions of Americans households living in these budget motels yeah. across the long country. Long-stay now. I mean, they're called long-stay motels, right? Yeah. yeah. They, uh, I mean, uh, as a... Uh, as hospitality models in the hospitality industry, these motels are, they've outlived their commercial functionality. Um, they can't compete anymore. But uh, the owners are really functioning as landlords these days. And uh, they're, the residents in them are more or less permanent. And um, you can find them in all parts of the country. They're not invisible. It's not the invisible homeless, but uh, they're, they're, they're not as visible as people on the streets. Mm -hmm. And are they defined as homeless? Well, yes and no. It depends yeah. according to which agency of the federal government um, uh, you, you're looking at. My interest was more in, because I, I lived in the motels and I spent a lot of time reporting on the people living there. Um, 
their their own self perception about whether they were homeless. Yes, yes. And and about some half of, them of them said yes, and some of them no, right? Yeah. Yeah. They they're very much aware of the stigma attached to the label, so they did they didn't they did not want to uh, accept that label. And then there were there are many people who said yes, this is. This is not a home. <laughs> I'm I mean, homeless. Once, I mean, a lot of striking data that you put here on, on the book, but it almost makes it seem that the future of housing in this country, it's tending towards that. I mean, like uh, it's been growing the amount of, of population well, in motels. Motels are the default. I mean, they're affordable housing. They're the default model in many parts of the country, and um, and there, and I found a vast range of people living there. I mean, most people are employed to some degree, whether you know full time or part time. Um, they're middle class families in transition. You know, they've been evicted from their foreclosed homes. There were economic fugitives from the north, uh, climate refugees from the Caribbean, um, and um, and uh, also. Uh, Quite a lot of folks involved in the informal economy, and drugs and prostitution especially. So there's a number of different economies circulating around the motels. And for someone who is uh, a, a reporter slash ethnographer like myself, yes. <laughs> it, 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 it was very, very interesting. And, and then you contrast, I mean, not only the, the issue of the, the rising number of Americans, and especially kids, there's a, a big mention of the amount of kids and the stigma that kids have. Um, uh, some parents, you know, have to make it seem like if it's a home because they don't want to, you know, yeah. get their kids be into that. It's a but single room. It's a, it's a single room, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and then we're going to get back into how all of this relates to Disney, which is how we started the podcast. But you are also mentioning the rise not only of the motels, which I guess would be the better off of the homeless. Uh, we yet to define if that's homelessness or not. But then you are also going to tents. Right, which is a totally woods, different thing, yeah, right? The woods, yeah. The, in the woods, yeah. And 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 something I was striking is that you make a, a very strong also racial differentiation between what's in the woods and what's in, in the motels. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The woods are where you where you go when you're evicted from the motels, and you don't want to be in the streets. Um, in the woods, the tent encampments in the woods again. It is a, a rapidly growing population nationwide and is much more invisible as a homeless population than the tent cities in the so cities. You say that the way that you detect them is like you start going into off-roads and you start seeing like pieces of trash or something that is remaining and then you, you more or less continue that off-road and you end up in one of those woods. Yeah, yeah. It's not, once, once, you know, once you know the telltale signs and if you want to access and go and visit, then you'll, you'll know how, how to do it. Um, it's not uh, it's it's not the safest thing in the world to do. I mean, a lot of guard dogs, trip wires, and so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah. Uh, but I figured out how to do it, and um, so I spent a lot of time um, visiting and interviewing people um, who'd ended up there, and some of them had been there for 10, 15 years. I mean, these were people who a lot of them were. Since the financial crisis, perhaps, or uh, longer than that, longer than that. Yeah, yeah lo some of them even longer than that. They were predominantly white, um, with a rural background. Yeah, that's what struck me in the. In so the they research. had a, their comfort zone, living in the woods with within their comfort zone. Yes. Even though they're living with <laughs> alligators and <laughs> possums and so on and so forth, and some of the tent uh, city setups were quite elaborate, very well organized with self-elected leaders. Um, and rules, and um, a lot of them were organized by uh, consumption. So there, mm. were, there were meth camps and heroin camps and beer camps. Wow. I was offered a lot of beer, but no one offered me meth or heroin, <laughs> I have to say. You have to pay for that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some quite elaborate compounds that, that people had fashioned for themselves. And overall, I don't mean to romanticize the communities because these are mostly people living under conditions not of their choosing and their conditions of adversity. Um, there were principles of mutual aid that I found um, pretty much everywhere within, within the tent encampments yeah. uh, that, that people were honoring. Yes. 
And so there's um, a certain collectivity, I would say, you know, certain absolutely uh, yeah, com, com, a, a community, and which yeah. something I, I would say was contrasting to the motels that you could perhaps you could not find that so much there. A I'm little sure. less so, a little uh -huh. less so. I mean, you you could have privacy uh, in the motels, of course. There were there was a vibrant communities on the corridors, the exterior corridors, but uh, people came and went. There was more turnover. In the woods, you really do depend on your neighbors for all sorts of things, resources, information, uh, tips, um, and, uh, and, and also goods, because you know goods are exchanged and so on and so forth. So um, it's much more of a close-knit community in a way. Again, I don't mean to romanticize this, um, but this, this was an alternative society. It was not uh, disengaged from the mainstream economy because, again, I found people full-time employed, part-time employed, scavenging or panhandling or in the informal economy. So they were engaged in the economy for the most part. Uh, they, they just they were not paying rent. Yes, <laughs> and and of course these these what you found here could be very easily said that it gets replicated around the United States, right? I mean, we're just before we started the podcast, we we're talking a little bit about Portland and, and we're talking about California and we're talking about, of course, here in New York City, we can see certain aspects of that. The situation here is different, but there is no doubt that um, during the last two decades, perhaps, there's been a tremendous sort of evolving line towards motel and towards tent, right, as uh, something that, it also something striking where you started to talk about the tents and also the motels, but specifically other tents, you refer to settlements uh, of the 1910s or 1920s, mm. I mean, like, you know, like, uh, it's the coming Hoovervilles. back, you yeah, know, the uh, yeah. 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 or the settlements that existed during the Gilded Age or, yeah. or, or these kinds of, uh, of situations. So it seems that that, that is the direction. And uh, I want to go back to that uh, celebration town, you know, the Disney thing, because in your book you mentioned that Disney might not be the, the, the principal driver, or perhaps it is. Uh, there may need, might be other things, you know, in the economic, social scenario, political scenario of the United States that uh, push people into the brink of that. But certainly uh, companies such as Disney uh, had a lot to do with this, right? And you start to explain... Um, uh, vacation homes, right? You start to explain the developments that uh, that Disney has put in into resort kind of scenarios, the segmentation of different classes, the rise of, of prices on the getting in there, the tourism industry, um, all of that. Um, can you give us a sense of like the major findings or the major sort of situations in, 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 in a way that you can tell, well, this is how Disney has contributed Mm -hmm. to this. Mm -hmm. And Disney, I would say in Florida, but you also mentioned here examples of Apple and Amazon or the large corporations that become, you know, somehow involved in development, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, 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 I think it's an important question because uh, you mentioned the, the big tech companies in the West Coast, they have been, you know, targeted and blamed for rising rents in their backyard. And, um, uh, you know, whether they are to blame for that is another issue, but they have responded. They rolled out these billion dollar programs. They're, they tend to be longer on PR and shorter on philanthropy than, than they could be, but at least they've responded and they're, they're affordable housing programs. No one expects companies like Disney or, um, or Walmart, the big service sector yes. companies to to do anything along those lines, to really, you know, uh, to show any kind of interest in, in, in affordable housing provision for their employees. And, and they're the low wage employees, of course. Yeah, but nevertheless, Disney, you mentioned here, but Disney trains or like shows their employees how to apply for food stamps, right? I mean, they have all these sort of things. Yeah. So they're very much on the knowledge of the sort of the, the amount of the low wage condition. Very much so. That. No, yeah. very much so. Absolutely. And the unions at Disney, I mean, Disney is a union company. Um, the unions waged a very successful $15 campaign, which I, yeah. I cover in the book. Yeah. I tell the story in the book through the perspective of the union employees. Yeah. 
And uh, it was a very important campaign because it, it had a uh, it had a knock-on effect. Florida, the state of Florida, the voters passed a fifteen dollar amendment for the entire state the next year. So you know, big win, uh, like the other fifteen dollar wins across the country. But the the brutal reality of it is that fifteen dollars is not going to close the housing gap. No. Even in Osceola County, which is a poor county, it's a yes. working class county. Did you dedicate a big part of the beginning of the book to this county? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that, that's where a lot of the Disney workers live. And in Osceola County, you would need at least $19 an hour to afford a studio, a market rents. And so uh, the 15... And that's already being rent burden. Yeah, yeah. Yes. that's rent And so the $15 is not going to get you there. It's not enough. Um, and uh, the company certainly has land available that it could put aside and, and donate to a community land trust uh, or limited equity cooperatives or any of the, you know, the social housing models that uh, urbanists love to talk about and advocate for. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not on the cards. <laughs> it's not going to happen. We shouldn't expect large corporations to do that kind of thing, of course. The solutions to the housing crisis lie elsewhere, but uh, they're, they're responsible for these conditions. Yeah, for yeah the no, most and part. especially like you, you mentioned that uh, they do as much as possible to evade taxation, to taxes. I mean, they, they basically yes. don't take responsibility on a lot of the things yeah. that that are clearly, uh, you know, they know it's happening. Um, you know, you you paint a very bleak picture of the Disney employee. Uh, the basic Disney employee, you know, a person that dresses up on, I mean, like some kind of Disney character. So they like love that. working there. Um, and, and, and that they, you know, go out and then they go to their tents or they go to the motel, right? Uh, and, and live that kind of life so that they're able to uh, participate in, I guess, the number one employer of the area, which is Disney, right? Yeah. Or, or the other large tourist industry Firms, which aren't all that much different, you know, Universal uh, is not all that much different. Um, but uh, uh, they love working in the, in the theme parks. And uh, I, I report on this in the book, the disjunct between yes. the, the pleasure that they generate, the gratification that's generated on the job, which they're able to separate from uh, the hardship that they... Um, to the experience. Yeah, it almost you make it seem like there's some kind of pride now of uh, of uh, being able to work there, or like uh, an opportunity more than anything else. It's a fun job. Yeah, that's what they say again and again and again. And and I, and I you know I, I have no reason to disbelieve them. Yes. Uh, at the same time, they they do they do resent not well, at having the same the time. They're, 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 these companies are posting record profits, you know, year after year after year. Yes. Right. And uh, and then you see the conditions in which the employees are, are, are at and, and, and sort of the lack of involvement of these, these companies in terms of the lobbying pro workers. Rather, the lobbying is mostly pro more extraction, right, pro more finance. And this brings me to that, you know, a part in your book, which is almost at the end when you begin to talk about financialization and all of that, because, you know, Disney for a long time was a, has been a very big player right in the in the development of central florida but um uh, you have new players right in this case uh wall street mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. uh, as we were talking about celebrations downtown i mean this is clearly a, a, mm -hmm. a firm that wall street from the bot uh, this downtown center but you also refer to other players that are coming in into new pieces of land right um oak hill Right, uh, Oak Hills, I think it's is what it's called. I mean, uh, uh, big debates around also the Church of the Latter Day Saints uh, and other forms of development and how they keep on pushing developmental boundaries. Right, the limits of the city uh, keep on being lobbied to expand and expand and expand. Um, mm -hmm. There's something that I found um, very interesting. How you're concluding, almost concluding the book on that on that side. I mean, like make us aware of that financialization and how the play on the profit of land uh, has a consequence in you know, the livelihood of this population. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about that chapter specifically. Um, well, yeah, I think you're referring to the, 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 the chapter of the book, which is about the eastern part of central Florida, where the Mormon church yes. has vast land holdings. Yes. 
uh, more than more than Disney actually, although they get a lot of less attention. Yeah. And they have one of the biggest ranches in the U.S. out there, and I've been waiting for the opportunity to develop. Uh, and that opportunity arose in the last decade and a half, and so they had plans approved through Osceola County for a brand new city for half a million people um, that will be developed on very environmentally fragile land. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, it's a particular interest to uh, environmentalists because the wildlife corridors, north-south wildlife corridors in Florida um, are, are intact there. And a lot of you know, species depend on those corridors. So it's a very controversial development. And, um, and the story I tell in the book <coughs> is about the expanding urban growth boundaries in the county itself. Urban growth boundaries are a tool that planners use to try and contain sprawl and, um, and, yes. and prohibit development outside the boundary. But you visit any jurisdiction and you'll find a history of uh, landowners whose land lies outside of the boundary lobbying officials yes. to have the boundary extended, Ever which happens everywhere. Yes. Yes. That's exactly what happened here. Yeah. Um, and in this case, the Mormon church is so powerful that um, they were able to have the boundary ex extended all the way to the county limits. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and make room for this, this vast new development of half a million people, which is not particularly compact, it has to be said. Very suburban, <laughs> right, in its own. It's, it's more suburban than, yeah. than the urbanists, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, and in this in this new uh, uh, development that is being proposed, I mean, you pose a, a, I mean, two questions right now. One is the environmental impact. Uh, in, you you talk to the one of the planners or the main planner, right? Uh, mm -hmm. White uh, mm -hmm. person, that was his last Don name, White, yeah. uh, Don White, um, in which you address the environmental question to 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 him, and uh, it seemed, they seem to be like putting aside all oh, the animals always you know are in the city and there's no problem or something like that. So there are huge problems with this, um, and on the other hand, I think it relates to our conversation uh, earlier, which is. Who's gonna be living there? I mean, like, we're right now. You paint a picture where the housing growth, the people that actually live in this county or that live in Central Florida, are tending or the, the to go into motels and to you know uh, 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 encampments or something like that. Um, you have some residents like in Celebration that are a bit wealthy. Uh, you have, of course, uh, vacation homes, and you have all kinds of other touristic uh, uh, issues there. But you're talking about a, a town of a several hundred thousand people that has been, you know, proposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who is going to do this? Who's going to buy this, right? They used to hear, you know, bulldoze for 180,000 homes, new homes. Yeah. Are we talking here just according to you, finance capital? Or what? who's moving there? Well, a thousand people move to Central Florida every week and have been doing for the last 50 years. Yes. And there's no, um, there's no evidence that that pattern is going to sufficiently alter yeah. in the next several decades because Central Florida itself isn't, isn't uh, especially vulnerable to sea level rise as South That's Florida exactly is. That's exactly where I was heading to, yeah. yeah. yeah so it's, yeah. It's, uh, a lot of people believe that large parts of South Florida cities, populations will be moving inland as climate refugees in future decades. So they're thinking in the future of a climate crisis, you know. I, I think in one of the answers of uh, uh, you put here is that they actually believe that these 180,000 houses will be for climate refugees. But of course of wealthy, you know, climate refugees yeah. that are able to afford yeah. this. Right? Yeah, the environmentalists believe that. The, Mar the Mormon church, the planners would never say that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the, yeah, the environmentalists believe that that's where Miami, Miami will move to the city or large parts of the population uh, when Miami is uninhabitable, which it, which it will be. There's no, there's no so question. in your view, the speculative sort of finance capital and so on won't be so much players in that region. And, or, or is it uh, also a big part? I mean, it's not only 180,000 
sort of families moving there no that are climate right. I have no doubt. The, the corporate investors who, who moved into the real estate market after the crash, that was a point of big, the big point of entry. Everyone expected uh, that to be a short-term play. Like they snapped up all these foreclosed homes, they rented them out, and then when the, when the value, property values uh, uh, were restored, they would sell them off. Yes. That, was, that was what the expectation was. Hasn't turned out that way. Um, it's turned out to be more of a permanent presence. In fact, last year, um, uh, one in six homes purchased in the U.S. was bought by corporate investors. And in some markets, as many as one in four. Yeah. And it's not just single family homes, it's all, all real estate classes, really. Yes. Um, mobile home parks, yes. student housing, hospitals, yeah. um, multifamily housing. Wall Street has really uh, made itself a permanent presence. So the, that's the story of the financialization of housing, which, uh, which, is, which is causing a human rights crisis. I mean, it's not just a housing crisis, it's a human rights crisis all over the world. Um, and so, is that going to have a long-term, is that going to be a long-term pattern? At the moment, it looks as if it, w it yeah. would be. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're living in very precarious times, yeah. Miguel. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, as I was reading about uh, in, in the chapter, we discussed in more detail the motels, right? And you, you discuss in the uh, a part, there was a chapter where you discuss the landlords, I mean, the owners of the motels, and you uh, categorize them as, you know, as mom and pap type of uh, uh, sort of owners, right? You're not talking about corporations yet, although there are always some mostly. corporations. And I couldn't kept thinking about, okay, if the 2008 financial crisis rendered companies, almighty companies such as Blackstone, right? And Blackstone basically taking over all the foreclosed properties around the world, not only uh, here, and, and trying to create a stock, right, in which rental homes become the norm. Mm -hmm. uh, at least that seems to be the situation. How long w would it take in order for these companies to take the motels? Right. If that is, you know, the type of because the, the motels, on the other hand, le give a certain de depend on the county you're in the United States, a different kind of rights to the to the dweller. Let's put it this way. And so as I was reading your book, I was just becoming more scared and scared about not scared, but like, God, this is this. This is a very near future. Right. When when we're not talking about the direct financialization in terms that Wall Street invests in this, but it's companies that work with Wall Street, such as Blackstone Group. Uh, getting involved already in the housing of homelessness. Yes. Whatever. I mean, I know it's an oxymoron to say that, but that's yeah. more or less the situation. Yeah. Well, there's. Uh, it's certainly not. Um, it's not off the table. Um, the mobile home parks in Florida are a huge part of the housing inventory, and they have become affordable housing <coughs> um, default model for affordable housing. And uh, there's been a concerted move in to, purchase, um, to purchase mobile home parks uh, by private equity. The motels, uh, it's um, here in New York City, Eric Adams, the new mayor, yes. one of his affordable housing planks is to turn a lot of hotels yeah. into yeah. affordable housing. Yeah. And, um, and it, that, to me, that's a no-brainer. Uh, if the city can retain some kind of control over the management or ownership of those, then uh, I, I, I can't help but you know, advocate for that or applaud mm -hmm. it. That's not the way cities work these days, though. No. <laughs> um, yeah, most they, of these places, at least under the last year, yeah, they're private They're looking partners. for either private yeah. partners or total privatization. Yeah. So uh, that's more than likely to happen. Um, it's beginning to happen in LA and uh, in central Florida, where there's a vast surfeit of these properties. I found that even, uh, even on the strip that I was focusing on, Route 192, this, this commercial strip in Osceola County, that um, there were more and more of the properties being sold to faraway owners, absentee owners in the last 10 years. And so that mom and pop model that you yes. talked about 
is, is probably fast disappearing. Uh, it was an East Indian mom and pop model in the US. Yes. The majority of motels Part of that in American the dream now, coming yeah. here and owning a motel. Yeah, yeah. mostly Gujarati families. Mm -hmm. And um, so they are, you know, they're, they're a dying generation as motel owners mm -hmm. in Central Florida now. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, I mean, we could definitely see the future happening where these, these temporary or let's say long stay places, you know, um, are totally taken over by industry because of profitability, profit and so on. And they are profitable, yeah. no question. For the owners, yes, because the the rents, the uh, like three hundred a week or two hundred a week. Yeah, between two hundred fifty and three hundred a week. Yeah. They're slightly below market rents for apartments. Yes, and the reason people are there is because they can't afford first and last month's rent, basically. Yeah, and a security deposit. Yes, that's the difference. Yeah, they and just I don't have they that. They don't have to go through credit checks or something like that. Right? No. no. Yeah. And they don't pay utilities, yeah. uh, but it's just that the, the lack of that kind of cash on hand, uh, because the cash flow of most households in the U.S. is so tight, they just don't have that lump sum, yes. the bridge sum that's needed to get into an apartment. Yes, yes, yes. And in we've talked a lot about um, sort of the conditions of the crisis, um, uh, and in your book you also mention some... Um, hopeful scenarios. I mean, some, some forms of organization, some um, that are, uh, are pushing the boundaries in the direction we want to see them. Um, and what were your takes on this? I mean, uh, the uh, activism that exist and what were the certain triumphs, what are the directions that they're pushing? Yeah. Well, I, I wish I could say there was more optimism to report on from my field site. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there is in New York City, the housing justice yes. movement in cities is going gangbusters and yes. doing great things. Um, but from in most parts of the country, there, there's very little in the way of organizing around housing. And certainly in Central Florida, there's virtually none. And the planners, uh, however well intentioned they are, and I, you know, I spent a lot of time following uh, the planners in Osceola County and Orange County, describing how they used everything in their toolkit mm. to re to really try and generate affordable housing. The challenges were really formidable. Um, the main one being. Florida is one of the 27 states in, in the country that has preemptive laws at the state level that prohibit rent controls, yes. prohibit inclusion rezoning, uh, prohibit any real efforts to generate any affordable policies, housing. Yes. So yeah. you can have the best will in the world at the local level in these county and, and, and small town jurisdictions, but uh, you're, you're overridden by state law. So what overrides state law is of course the federal government and that's where, we, that's where we would look for a comprehensive solution to the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. The federal government is in a position of doing that. As we know, the federal government is pretty gridlocked right now and, um, and uh, the affordable housing provisions it rolls out are, you know, are, are minimal. That said, Biden's latest effort, I noticed, um, prioritizing the sale of uh, foreclosed homes to yes. nonprofits and community developers. They don't want to make the same mistake that the Obama administration yes. made yeah. back in yeah. 2011. Yeah. So it's a it's a baby step, but it's a step in the right direction towards you know what we would call social housing. Yeah. It seems that that, I mean. When you were alluding to the 1910s and 1920s encampments and settlements around, and then you're mimicking this, you know, like almost a century after to the conditions of housing that are appearing, right, on a daily basis. If you look historically at what actually, uh, uh, what were the policies, what were the things that somehow help ameliorate that housing crisis that we're talking in the early 20th century? Um, do you see any parallels of movement of, of like apart from this effort from Biden? In my view, I, I don't see uh, anything coming together. Uh, I mean, and, and and I wonder in, in in your position if you saw something else happening 
right, from the governmental perspective, or as you say, from the federal perspective, we have that Biden thing. But most of the policies that still affordable housing runs in the United States uh, date back decades, right? And yes. they correspond to a totally different time. I mean, they, they, it was not the time of now. Like, like the most recent way perhaps was in the white flight, you know, in the 1960s and 1970s, no? Um, and there were some efforts done specifically in major urban areas. But besides that, it seems that we, we lack of any sort of comprehensive policy direction, right, or political direction. Well, in terms of public housing provision, uh, certainly, I mean, since the Clinton administration, it's been almost impossible, legally impossible, to mm -hmm. build any more public housing. That, that, um, that amendment has been, uh, has been overridden now, in Congress at least, um, <coughs> the Fair Cloth Amendment. And so it may be possible now to envisage uh, a new program of, uh, of public housing Social housing is, um, is not necessarily rental housing. Social housing is a vast spectrum that also includes uh, property owning um, provisions, uh, but, but ones that aren't tied to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and they're much more popular in Europe, obviously, than they are here. Most yes. Americans don't know what social housing no, is, no. but... Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a sacrilege to call it <laughs> social housing here. I, I've I've learned to call it public housing or affordable housing because you put the word social in yeah. front and it becomes complicated. Yeah, but it, it, these these are home ownership options. Mm -hmm. um, they're just not you know they're not tied to speculative marketplace, and obviously that's the way to go. Uh, the the power, however, of that model of uh, market delivery of housing, which has been the dominant model, um, especially since the 1990s, is, 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 so, uh, is, so, is so chronically flawed at this point in time, but remains the dominant model, mm -hmm. that the efforts when I mean, local governments and state governments and federal governments to say, we, we just need to provide a little more sugar to the developers. Yeah so that they'll produce more affordable housing. Indeed. Well, yeah, it, yeah. it hasn't worked. Yeah. I think yeah. the record shows that for several decades it, yeah. it has miserably failed. And, and also you, there's a, such a gap between market rates and whatever would be affordable rates, right? Like, and when we talk about like here in New York City, like half of the population lives almost around the poverty line, right? I mean, like, uh, and, and so you're talking about like a market rate housing here it's tremendously, impossibly afford affordable for anyone that it doesn't make a good bulk at a six-figure salary. And so you're talking that, that the differences between affordability and market rate, are be there's a, an enormous gap that it seems like how, how to close it, right? And this brings me to, um, I mean, a part where you conclude in your book where you say the following. New paradigms of public and social housing should reflect these diverse arrangements by incorporating co-housing, granny flats, communes, single room occupancies, intergenerational group dwellings, and a range of hybrid quarters that anticipate and facilitate how we are likely to occupy as well as earn a living in our homes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With this in mind, mm -hmm. I want to ask you something I always ask my guests when we conclude the podcast, which is... Uh, what is your utopian scenario? What is your uh, most hopeful vision? What is it that you would love to see happen in the coming 10 years that um, helps sort of shift the direction that you wrote in this book? Mm -hmm. what, what is your ideal in this case? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's not an easy question in the no, case of this It's always very complicated for because, all guests. Yes. Because there's so many components of the housing crisis. But just to dwell on, on that, what, you, what you read there from the end of the book, I'm, I'm trying to get at the, the issue of the dweller, uh, and in particular in relationship to the history of public housing, because I feel that of all of the critiques of public housing, I mean, most of them are bogus, um, but the one critique I think that resonates with me is, is uh, you know, the degree to which the, the occupant, the resident, the dweller, is just not consulted at all in the design of, yes. the, of the living environment. It's just assumed that their needs, 
their needs can be estimated, their needs can be calculated and, and provided for by the planner in a very top-down fashion. And it seems to me that is, um, that's a very flawed model mm -hmm. um, of building and also of living. Um, and given the, the broad variety of households these days, I mean, it's not as if, you know, the nuclear family household was ever particularly dominant norm, yeah. but even less so now, uh, and the need for different kinds of live-work environments, we, we really need to put dwellers at the center of, um, of the, the design. So you're talking more like uh, uh, giving up uh, more power to, to the dweller? Uh, decision-making power? Well, or, or certainly making them participants yeah. in, in, in the design um, to a degree that just hasn't been the case in, in the history of housing provision. Um, and e even, in, even in sort of con the consumer marketplace where, you know, buyers are given a choice, like a consumer choice sure. of different styles yeah. and so on and so forth, it's a very ersatz version of that. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that's the utopian part yes. of the answer I think you're looking for. It, it is, it is. Um, but it's not, I, I, I don't think it's unfeasible. No, no, and I have to tell you of the many people I've, uh, I've been interviewed so far for the podcast that we talked about housing. This is actually how they, they see the future should be like, right? Um, really? Uh, yes, and uh, it, it parallels many, it parallels m you know, my work with the Urban Front. Mm -hmm. um, this is what we say that uh, it, it is more about the uh, shifting power or decision power to communities and, and not giving it back to the government anymore, right? Um, and uh, giving certain autonomy of decision to, to communities. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's what we always, uh, one of the many things, utopian scenarios that we, we look into. I don't, that said, I don't, I don't think that kind of issue is a, is a driving force within the housing justice movement right now. I mean, they have more important priorities. <laughs> yes. Um, but the, the danger is always that, you know, the, the priorities then become, you know, the, 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 the sort of driving factor. And, yeah. and these other issues get left behind unless they're, they're on the table always from the beginning. You know, one lesson that we can draw from um, one of many of, of your book is that when you're discussing new urbanism and you, you're discussing uh, Platter Saivik and Duani Platter Saivik, which were one of the main firms that promoted new urbanism, you said it precisely. I mean, they, they, they were focused on new policy, the lobbying of new policy. And it seems to me that a lot of uh, people today are not focused on that. <laughs> and and mm. so the mm -hmm. policy continues to be drafted by, by the powers being, meaning developers and mm -hmm. Wall Street financiers. By uh, default. By yeah. default. By yeah. default. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, Andrew. No, it's been a pleasure. Uh, it's, no, it's, it's always an honor to talk to you. And I hope I get you back in a few months or so on your next book. <laughs> I assume the next book is coming very soon. It is, actually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so thanks a lot. This was another episode of Cities After. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to subscribe.